In the previous video, we discovered the relationship between the shift tensors, really, I should say, among the shift tensors for the double embedding. The picture was over here. I erased it because we'll need the board space in a moment. So now let's discover the relationship among the curvatures, which, of course, is obtained from this relationship by another differentiation. Of course, the proper operator to apply is the covariant derivative, because it will lead to tensors and eventually invariants. So the derivative that will apply to both sides is this, sub psi, the covariant derivative sub psi, the covariant derivative defined on the surface. I once again repeat that some of these things may look unfamiliar. This, these are funny symbols. You're not used to seeing the shift tensor with the capital Greek index. But of course, you should just train yourself to see the equivalence, the, the analogy to the case that you've already considered. It's just that now we have three different manifolds, so we need three different alphabets. But the role of the objects and all of the properties and the definitions of the covariant derivatives and all of that all works the exact same way. And the properties and the chain rule that will arise here will all work the same way. So let's go ahead and apply this derivative to both sides of the equations. Of course, remembering all along that what we have here is an identity in the curve coordinates as the independent variables. So it's appropriate to use this derivative. So we'll be very careful and slow and deliberate. So on the left hand side we have this covariant derivative applied to the shift tensor Z I phi. And on the right we will have this derivative apply to the product zi alpha s alpha phi. And you can see that I chickened out from using the product rule right here because I knew I would clash with the title. Okay, so what do we have on the left hand side? Well on the left hand side we have what we call the curvature normal tensor. It's not quite the curvature normal because it's not yet an invariant. Of course will raise the index, contract, and it will be an invariant, but for now it is not an invariant. So I can write psi phi, or I can write phi psi, I will write uh, phi psi because I think it sounds better and maybe it's in the proper alphabetical order. Uh, but of course this object is symmetric in its capital Greek indices, so the order doesn't matter. So I'll just write it in the order that I prefer. Okay, equals. Now we're going to use the product rule. Let's see what we get here. So I will discuss this object in a moment. Z I alpha. I already gave away what we do here, but pretend you didn't hear and try to decide for yourself how we'll proceed with this object. Z alpha phi top plus, excuse me, plus Z I alpha and then this derivative apply to this object. So I'll have an opportunity to actually tell you what it is in a moment. So right now I'll write it unchanged and why don't you also pause and think about what this object is. This object is something that you're totally familiar with already. Uh, maybe not totally because it showed up in the last two videos but try to figure out before you see what I write on the next line. So on the next line, I'll just continue with the equal sign. All right, sorry about that. We got interrupted by a phone call from my lovely wife, which is always a pleasant surprise. But I think I was saying that I'll just give myself a little bit more space. And we'll now talk about this very exciting object. And here is what's going on. So when you talk about the shift tensor, with respect to the am with respect to the derivative on the curve in that sense it is defined in the entire ambient space with respect to the curve so this is of course it's the situation is a little bit richer because there's also this ambient index this surface index but nevertheless the chain rule applies it's a very simple exercise i'm sure it's in the book uh, but I'll let you figure it out that the chain rule still applies to this object because this object is defined not on the curve 
but in the entire ambient space, not in the overall ambient space, but on the ambient space of the curve embedded in the surface. So even though there's still this funny index, that doesn't matter. The shift, excuse me, the chain rule deals with that perfectly fine. So the chain rule does apply to this situation. So what you will have is the derivative sub beta. I'm also, maybe I shouldn't have done it, I'm doing it all in one step. Z i alpha times the shift tensor beta psi. It's just that I'll group it with this one so they are together. So S alpha phi unchanged. And from the chain rule, which ordinarily goes here, but we're going to put it here, Z beta psi. Very nice. Plus Zi alpha unchanged. And of course this, all right, let's see what this is. Of course this is just the curvature uh, normal tensor. Right? Because we cannot assume that this is a hypersurface, that the curve is a hypersurface with respect to its ambient surface. So we're just going to write it quite generally this way. Uh, and here is slightly different notation that I use. Uh, you will see why in a moment. Well, do I even have to? I think I do. So I now will use a lowercase b. You will understand why shortly, I believe. Alpha phi. So psi phi, or because the order doesn't matter, and it's symmetric, phi psi, just because I like the sound of that a little bit better. So phi psi. So these are, I think, some of the most enjoyable moments in tensor calculus. I've referred to this before because you're, you feel like you're watching a movie and you can't wait to find out how it waits. How it, how it ends, but of course you wait because the action itself is very exciting. And then you finally arrive at the final answer and all the indices match up and you know there is geometric meaning which is just around the corner because all of the objects that you're working with are tensors. So all you have to do is contract away all the indices and you're left with an invariance and a fine geometric result. So we'll discover what it is here. So I didn't mention why I used the lowercase letter. So whenever I'm talking about the embedding uh, of the curve within the surface, that so-called curve within that so-called surface, I try to use lowercase letters because clashes with the other embeddings are possible. So whenever there is an embed, so maybe this could have been a lowercase s, but there is no clash here, so I left it here. But you'll see with curvatures, especially when the curve is a hypersurface in the embedded surface, there might be clashes in symbols, which is what I'm trying to avoid. So it's good to use a lowercase letter here. And you will see some other examples of lowercase letters. But it's also a signal to me as if you seeing capital Greek letters was not enough of a signal that we're talking the embedding of the curve within the surface. OK, so here's our relationship. Let me box it. Oh, too, way too early to box it. Because we know what this is, of course. This is its own curvature normal tensor, B alpha, B I alpha beta. So let's write down the final answer. And actually, so that the boxing works well, I will start with this. So this, the curvature normal tensor of this embedding equals B I alpha beta, S alpha, ooh, excuse me, this should have been an S. Huh? have to add an annotation, S here, of course. Okay, S alpha phi, S beta psi, plus, maybe I should put Curvature comes first everywhere, so B alpha phi psi Z I alpha. 
So this is the relationship that we were after. It's the second order version of this relationship, which also deserves to be boxed. Okay. And it holds the key to the concept of the principal curvature and all of those other concepts as well, which we'll start working towards in the next video. But I just want to close by saying that this is the most general second order relationship. It works in full generality with respect to the dimensionalities. This doesn't care at all what the dimensions of the embeddings are. It could even be n-dimensional embedded in the n-dimensional spaces and so forth. Uh, this is a very general relationship. What else can I say about it? And it will have very, very many special cases when some of the curves are hypersurfaces within other curves, while with some of the surfaces are hypersurfaces with respect to their embeddings, and then we'll see the normals. Of course, because there is full generality with respect to dimension here, we're not seeing the normals. But once we assume the special case of the normals, we will see those normals uh, of hypersurfaces. We will see those normals, and we're going to do all of those things in the next video. And of course, the first order of business is to perhaps contract uh, the, the Greek indices. So at least we start working towards those invariants. Uh, so raise and contract. So we'll do that first, but in the context of some of the simplifying assumptions of the hypersurfaces. So that's what we're going to do in the next video. There is more information in this relationship than we'll use in the next video but we'll focus on hypersurfaces right away, and that will simplify the discussion, and we'll get to the concept of principal curvatures as quickly as possible. So that's our goal.